Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Lecture 5, the second Cascading Style Sheets uh, lecture, which will focus more on layout-like um, styles and also some of the advanced styling, um, such as background styling. <clears throat> um, OK, so uh, just last time, and I'll just throw this in. Um, so I just want to um, give a shout out to, I think it's, Oh man, I keep forgetting his name. Now I'm confusing him with Randall. Uh, do do. Oh, Matthew Inman. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, does he say copyright? Yeah, I think he says copyright. Okay. Um, last week I was talking about color and how humans can only see three channels. And I was trying to find um, this image, and it was right on the page that I was looking at. I, uh, I just looked at Mantis and said, no, that's not it. But it's the Mantis Shrimp. Um, so he just makes the point that dogs can see green and blue. <clears throat> uh, humans can see green, blue, and red. So, you know, we can see more colors. Butterflies, they've got two other channels. I thought it was one more channel, but um, they've got... Uh, uh, two other ones, and then the mantis ship. Uh, sorry, the mantis for mantis shrimp um, has sixteen color receptive cones, so um, they can see in thermonuclear bomb of light and color. So um, I just thought I'd give a quick shout out to the oatmeal comics mantis shrimp. Um, yeah, anyway, a uh, great website, um, XKCD and theoatmeal.com. <clears throat> um, very, uh, very popular websites in my book. So um, that's just finishing off the last lecture. If you didn't see the reference, uh, I was talking about color in the last couple of slides in the last lecture. So the first thing is uh, we're looking at styling text, um, the more modern way of styling text, uh, borders and understanding the box model. So, um, so the old school way, and still, you know, I, I'm not going <clears> to <throat> um, put this down too much. When when you specify a font family. Um, what you would do is you would say, I would really like this, the first choice font, to be the font that's delivered to the client. But if that client doesn't have that font on their machine, then uh, I guess I'll have the second choice. Now, put the second choice in quotes for a reason. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but if that one's not available, uh, I guess, you know, that really ugly font that every computer is guaranteed to have, that, that one will do. So, um, and this is probably what we used to see in the past is, you know, well, maybe not Times New Roman, but, you know, we'd see a nice font. <clears throat> so, um, Artique Times New Roman. Uh, if that one's not available, then Times New Roman, then, you know, Times, and then, you know, just, just a font that's got little curly bits. So, a font that's got some serif on it, that means it's got little, little sort of bowls. I don't actually have any serif fonts here. I wonder if Canvas does. No, Canvas doesn't either. Um, what have I got open? Um, basically, if, if you think about Times New Roman, Times New Roman has got little curly things on the font. Uh, let me just nah, let's see if I can just hack this temporarily. So this paragraph. I'll just say a font family. <clears throat> Tab. <clears throat> so uh, if you look really closely, you can see, you know, like little swirls on the edge of the things. So that's that's a that's a serif font and a sans serif font is a font that um, doesn't have anything. So uh, I'll just reset this. Is basically, you know, the, the line 
do, doesn't change any its weight. And so I suppose the G is the most common character to look at. Uh, do I have a G there? Yeah, the G, you know, mm, there's no sort of like thickness, thickness differences. Oh, oh there we go. <laughs> I, I keep forgetting I've thought of this already. So a font with curly ends like this one, a font without curly ones like this one. And also there are monospace fonts where um, um, if you like the letter I and the letter W, takes up the same amount of space. So um, each letter takes up the same amount. Very good for receipt pages uh, where <clears throat> you want all the all the characters to line up both horizontally and vertically. So that's that's how we used to do it in the olden <clears throat> olden days. Uh, no. <clears throat> no thanks. Um, but um, CSS3, this was a, a real problem. We were thinking, look, you can download images and you can, <clears throat> you know, download text and things. We really need a way that we can sort of download fonts so a user can download the fonts that we want the user to, to use. <clears throat> so um, these fonts, they may be on your computer, I don't know, but uh, it's not necessary for these fonts to be on your computer for you to be able to use them. Um, and how and how um, this has been done is um, you can either use the font face rule. So if you've got this stored in your file system, so I've got this stored in my fonts folder, um, as part of this uh, website. And so I'm actually pushing the Star Trek font down to you so that you hopefully can see that in the Star Trek uh, font family. Um, so I've I sourced this font from um, dafont.com and I think it's like free as long as it's for uh, personal or non-commercial use. Um, so that's dafont and um, and the museo, I just got that from RMIT somewhere. Uh, so that's the font face rule, and you just pop that in the style sheet. Um, and so whenever you name a family, uh, it, you, what you do is you, you're declaring it here, so it's Star Trek, and then you can use it um, later on, and it will, it will know where to find that font. I realize I've got to tell you about the quotes. Um, so the quotes are optional if there's no space. So if a font family doesn't have any spaces in it, you don't have to use quotes. But uh, second space choice, because it's got a space in it, you do need to use the quotes. And uh, Times New Roman, it's got three words. That's why you need quotes. Times doesn't have any. Serif doesn't have any. So quotes are optional. And... Um, just you know, just instead of saying star space trek, I like not typing quotes if I can get away with it. So I uh, just said Star Trek with no spaces. Um, but what's been happening is Google <clears throat> quite kindly have put together this um website where you can have a look through all these guaranteed free fonts, and you might think, um, okay, well. <clears throat> I really want a serif font. Um, and then you might think, oh, no, no, not serif. I mean sans serif. Um, uh, these all look like writing. I need something, you know, for a display. So something for something fancy for, for headings, for example. Um, so these are generally bolder. All the, you know, things like this do creep in. Um, if you want something that's uh, handwriting, um, you know, all the handwriting fonts. If you want all the handwriting fonts that are good for displays. Oh, I think this is a union. I don't think it's a, yeah. You get both types, unfortunately. Um, so you might think, oh, I really like this one. Um, so you press plus, and the nice thing is, this will actually give you the code so that's what you need to put in your <clears throat> head element. So that will go and get um, 
that'll go and get that style sheet. So it's a link tag. It's just like embedding a style sheet into your um, web page. And in your CSS, this is how you um, use it. So obviously, you really want this font to be the font that's displayed. But let's just say there's a problem with Google Fonts. Um, maybe their server's not working, or wherever you are, it's blocking it, because it could be a virus uh, website. Um, it's good to put that full back in just in case that script is unavailable. So these days, there really is no excuse for not having uh, nicer fonts in a web page, because we can push these down to the client. Before CSS3, so many websites were just in Arial or Times, because you're pretty much guaranteed that those fonts were available on every computer. Um, now, there are, are some things, and this advice keeps changing, because even at RMIT, I've noticed no matter what I do, it, it seems to get blocked. Um, but if you use double dash, um, often the server will try HTTPS, and if that doesn't work, uh, it'll try HTTP. Um, Yeah, um, just just play around. Sometimes you'll find this one works. Sometimes that works. Um, but because um, you know browsers are trying to protect us users from malicious websites, <clears throat> um, sometimes <clears throat> if you use HTTP when you're using HTTPS, um, it'll say, "Oh, that's unsafe." content, do you wish to allow this unsafe content, which can be a little bit confusing for users. So um, I, gen I find that using double slash will, will um, it'll try the, it'll try the, um, it'll try the protocol that's in use currently. And if that fails, it will fall back and try, um, you know, the unsecure method. Um, so that's basically getting the from the family down. So this this font is supplied by Google, and I'm hoping that you can see this uh, kind of cool uh, My First Diary like font uh, there. So the font size. Uh, guess what? There's a property called font dash size, and the dash is pretty consistent um, with CSS. So it's not font capital S size. It's font dash size. Um, some units are absolute, so if you say how many pixels it should take, how many centimeters it should take, or millimeters, um, they will be fixed and they will not change. Um, but there are some other font sizes and which are relative, and so um, depending on how big their parent or grandparent node is, um, it will generally inherit those sizes. So what I was saying about you know how some CSS properties are inherited, um, relative sizing is is generally inherited, and so you'll get a kind of a scaling effect happening. Uh, so let me just show you an example. So these ones are currently in nested divs. So if I choose an absolute uh, size, there's really not much difference. They get bigger. Um, notice I'm using opt groups here. You know, there's lots of things in here, so I'm just trying to make this easier for you. Um, so relative to parents, I'm using 1EM. So these are all 1EM. By default, that's 16 points. But if I pick um, 1.5, this one is 1.5. EM relative to its parent, and this is 1.5 relative to its parent. So, what 1.5 times 1.5, 2.25, I think. I think I think that's what it is. So, um, and also if you go the other way around, uh, they just get smaller. 80 um, percent, 150 percent base. Hopefully, um, that will give you. An idea, and so that's relative to the parents. Now, this is relative to the HTM, HTML element. So, this is REMs. So, 
Um, so um, whatever the base, you know, the base size is. So let me just um, let me just turn this on. So I'm just going to play with this. So what I'm doing here is I'm changing the base size. So if I scroll down, these are now bigger because these, even though these are <clears throat> not growing relative to the parent, they are growing relative to the to the if you like the base size of the um, say the body element or the HTML element. Um, so I want to maybe check, pick a pixel one. So I'm going to choose 20 pixels just so it's a little bit obvious. Now if I change the size, they actually don't change. And if I make them really small, I'll have to find it again. Fingers crossed. Yeah, their, their size is now not changing. It's, it's fixed to be... Um, 20 pixels. So um, I just want to give you an, you know, an idea that there's not just fixed sizing, there's also this relative sizing. And if you ever do something like this, it, um, it does help to have some sort of relative sizing as you progress through your um, website. So I'll turn that off. <clears throat> and uh, just showing you um a slightly older version of what my um bar looked like but it's, it's pretty much unchanged um so that's the size um but sometimes we want to have like um you know slightly slopey text or bolder text and um there's the default browser you know the um user aid no not the user agent the vendor um style you know whether it's oblique or italic there's no visual difference but there might be you know a semantic difference so someone with a screen reader actually we're talking about styles so that's not even true um maybe there's just an option that if, if you want to style something with oblique text as opposed to italic text you can style it differently um <clears throat> font weight uh, is generally tuned you can use sort of english language words but there's a more specific way of specifying a number now i know it's it's 100 and 900 <clears throat> but there's only nine levels and this is a throwback to printers like um you know this was like i don't know They'd have all these character sets printed in lead or something, and there'd be the 100 and the 200 and the 300 um, weight size thing. Um, maybe I really should look that up on Wikipedia. Um, now, when you do pick a font, you may th find that um, 100 looks exactly the same as 200. Uh, yeah, there might only be one or two differences. Um, that's all down to the font designer. If the person who's designing the font has only got one, um, one or two different weights, uh, there will be very little difference. <clears throat> so normally, uh, bold and thin uh, will make a difference, but a lot of the time there won't be too much difference. So just to show you. Uh, the difference here, so I'm sort of going into like a thin version of the font. So that actually looks quite nice. Um, but if I want it to be bold uh, or bolder, so there's no difference between bold and bolder here. Lighter does look good. Just be aware of lighter. Um, the lighter the font, the the stronger the contrast needs to be. So if it's a thin font, the color and background contrast needs to be higher. Um, but did I, I can't remember if I covered that. I think we will probably be looking at it in the tute. So I'm just going to show you now that the 100 and 200 and 300 are the same. 400, that's when it's normal. 500, 600, 600 is bolder. Oh, 700 is bolder. 
Ooh, this is good. So, so there's no difference between 800 and 900, but um, I think there were four different levels there. So again, the numbers like colors. Um, you know, there's thousands or millions of colors. If you specify numbers, or if you just want to use words, you don't have that much uh, much range. Um, line height, this is another little trick. Uh, sometimes you can get a, a really nice font, but there's a really large gap, you know, when it goes to the next line. So you can um, you can change the line height, so you can tighten it up a little bit. Obviously, it can be too tight. Um, the default is 1.2, so, you know, um, um, there's normally a, a sort of default space between the lines uh, but you know if you're writing an essay in HTML and you've been asked for double spacing um, you can sort of increase uh, the line height but uh, I generally use this when I've, I've got a really nice font but um, you know it looks like that and I can just uh, just tighten up the space uh, so where's normal I don't know. Uh, now the distance between the letters. This is another little trick. Um, if you have, um, you know, you can tighten the text up. That probably makes it a little bit hard to read. But if if you're writing a menu, uh, you can put a little bit of extra spacing between the letters, and it looks a little bit sexy. And if you combine that with um, maybe the the light font you might have, you know. You, you can turn a boring font into something a little bit more interesting. Uh, don't go too far. And um, you can even go backwards, which I think is a bit crazy. Uh, probably not a good idea. So, yeah, just, just watch out for this. Little subtle, can, little subtle settings can make... Um, a font that's not quite working sort of work more um, better. Okay, so uh, text decoration and some of these styles, um, text decoration, sometimes forget, you know, which, what do I want? Uh, which one do I need to pick? So the text decorations gives you the, you know, the underline, that's important. So if you've got hyperlinks, you want to turn that underline off. Please do, but make sure there's some way that a user can identify visually a hyperlink if you're turning the hyperlink off. Uh, so what I'm saying in the assignments is to make your hyperlinks look like buttons, but not use the button element. You know, apply styles that make it button-like. There's one called overline, and instead of underlining, it draws a line over it. Um, I don't now, I'm not really 100% sold on this one, but um, it's possible. Of course, our favorites through or line through. So if you want to show something is crossed out, um, then use this one. I think there's one double line through as well. I'm not 100% sure on that. And there's a little bit of an inconsistency. I sometimes think that there, that there might have been two teams developing. So some things, you know, is text hyphen something. Uh, and other times it'll be font hyphen something. So, you know, I think text weight would be acceptable or font decoration. Um, you know, it's just, a, it's just a little thing. I put it down to maybe two teams. Might not have known what the other was doing. Or maybe there's a reason for it. Um, so I'm just going to pick some examples. That, that's overline, line through and underline. Um, now text alignment, and I'll just again declare my preference here. <clears throat> um, so there's initial, so left alignment. Uh, initial is is quite um, quite important because some languages read right to left. So um, if you say it's got to be left aligned, it may overwrite a website that actually leads right to left. So 
Um, initial is the best thing to do. Like left aligned is okay, but you may be upsetting people that read right to left. <clears throat> so left, that's a good one. Um, right alignment. Um, this is the main pitfall with right alignment that um, you know spaces between the bullets tend to jump. And the same is true for centered text. Um, again, this can be, and I am a really not a fan of centered reading text. So it looks like, you know, you get the worst of both worlds. It's untidy on this side and untidy on this side as well. Centered text is good for block headings and, you know, like bold text, maybe like five or six words, but not for reading text. There is justified text, which I, I think is nice. It's nice and neat on this side, nice and neat on this side. And, um, you know, what's happening is spaces are getting, let me just go initial. So check this line, spaces on this line will be just a little bit bigger than spaces on the other lines. And so this, I think this looks quite nice. That looks a little raggedy. But I do know people who hate justified text. Um, but I, I, I think it looks nice. Uh, vertical alignment, this one, I keep having to come back to this slide myself because uh, sometimes I say vertical align middle and it doesn't really work. So um, yeah, this has just been a problem. It's being fixed by the grid layout and the flex flex layout. Um, but if you ever have an image in text and you're like, oh, this is not good, you don't you don't vertically align the text. You actually vertically align the image so that the image is vertically aligned with the text and, you know, the net effect is basically. And I'll just show you. It, you know, the, the text just ends up being in the middle, which is really nice. And um, that's... I keep coming back to this slide because I keep getting this wrong and I'm trying to vertically align the text or I'm vertically aligning, aligning the paragraph and nothing's working. And then I remember, oh yeah, that's right. It's the image you have to vertically align. So you can do bottom and top. That's nice. Um, then there are these sort of small gap ones. Superscript, this is good for sign signs. So if you need to say um, centimeter squared and you want to have a two there, you can pop it up or a subscript. Um, it might be hard to see, but this image is definitely lower than the baseline. So, um, but if that's not enough for you, you can specify actual percentages. Uh, so one line up. Half a line down. Maybe there's a reason for this. And <laughs> 55 people. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure there's going to be EMs in there as well. So um, lots of things to play with. And I've got this slide, honestly, for my own reference, because I do keep keep forgetting myself. So there's a bit of an annoying gap there. I think baseline. No. So now this dotted line is just showing you the outline of the parent element. So if you were to turn that dotted line off, you'd probably see it in slightly better. But the Y is definitely touching the baseline. Sometimes you do need, you know, you know, pixel resolution so that the bottom of the Y and the image, it's kind of it can be really tough. And this is where designers waste all of their pay by getting things pixel perfect. And uh, get end end up getting paid five dollars an hour equivalent. Um, now text indentation. This is in the style. Sometimes you want to indent a paragraph, but sometimes you want it the other way around. So you want an outdent. Uh, you know, this one starts on the left, but then is pushed in. Um, you know, that's something that sometimes you need. And here's floating content. And this, again, this is a very important slide. Um, uh, I think I've, I've got, yeah. 
between 99 and 100 percent of page layout catastrophes and i will say catastrophes because elements are all over the place your footer is halfway up your page and the navigation is on the left of your content honestly between 99 percent and 100 percent of the time uh, it's because you're using float left or float right and the float style oh, i promise you trying to using it um, because uh, it does cause problems and uh, this slide demonstrates what's going on so i'm floating my image left and the text is then floating right so it float is best used for floating things left and there's so many tutorials that use float for floating text and they sometimes get away with it but when you when you sort of do this you see that the whole page falls apart but um they haven't tested their page properly so beware of any tutorial that asks you to float things because it's not it's generally not a not a good idea there is there is a need for it and i hope i will show you the only time you should use float so i want to float this image left um but um then all the text is floating around it which is just what i need the only trouble is then i have another image and this image doesn't quite clear the bottom of this mug if the page was smaller narrower i mean come on come on oh it's not going to clear oh yeah there it is that's you know you might say that's what i want but it doesn't work and um so what we need is a solution to this problem if you are floating elements so there's a, a style called clear and you can either clear the left or clear the right but uh, generally clear both is what you need so these are paragraphs so what i want is i want the next paragraph let me just show that for you so what's happening is this image oh this is another thing the if you see the height of the element um when you float a paragraph the the paragraph collapses so even though this mug is inside the paragraph the dimensions of the mug has collapsed i'll say that again the the dimensions of the paragraph that holds the mug and the text has collapsed and is now only the size of the um of the text because the image is floating and it's no longer being factored in to be the height of its parent element and this this is the essentially the problem so uh, what happens is the next paragraph that comes along this one so this one doesn't quite clear this mug and so it's um so you know the layout it says oh it should be starting on the left but it's it's um getting caught on this the bottom of this mug and so there's a style called clear both and i'm going to click the clear both so what's happening now even though the mug the paragraphs that contain the mug uh have have collapsed um the next paragraph so this paragraph here is clearing because what's happening is there's a there's a little um <clears throat> this paragraph clears looks for any little traps and it clears the mug and sometimes what you have to do is you have to put like a little invisible div here um, that has the clear both style so it then pushes the next content down and i'm going to show you and i've left this in here just so i can show you what's going on so i've got a clear both attached style attached to this um but i'm hoping it will yep caught it what's happening is even though this is clearing uh this element because i've got a left to align um what's happening is um this element is clearing this element but unfortunately this element is not clearing this element so because this uh box that the heading is in 
is not adapting to this right floating element. This right floating element is uh, breaking on very small screens. And I've left that in just so I can demonstrate that um, even if you do a lot to try and get this uh, style fixed, um, it can you can still have a breaking layout. So I would need to put in another clear both style, style so that when this comes down to the next line, it pushes it pushes the bottom down as well. <clears throat> and if you click that, that will remove the mug images so you can sort of see what's going on. So if there's no images, it's fine. And then you put the images back and it's all broken. Okay, so um, now we're gonna look at the box model. And uh, if you do inspect the element, there is this box model down the bottom. And so I strongly recommend you come and have a look at this. So I'm going to um, uh, say, pick this paragraph. So the, we've got the content inside. The content is this side. Then there's a bit of padding. Oh, okay, there's no padding. <laughs> Uh, there's no border, but there is a margin. So I want um, paragraphs to be 16 pixels or 1 EM separate from each other. Now that's not my style. That's the browser default style. So if I don't want automatic margins between my paragraphs, I can say paragraph margin top, margin bottom zero. Um, but that's the default uh, browser style for Chrome and probably for most browsers. Um, so the order is important. So if you think of this as a box that's got a television inside, you know, your, your padding, so those are your foam chips, or hopefully the um, nice new recycled cardboard stuff. Then there's the border, and that's the cardboard box. That's everything in. And then there's the margin, which is the space that's separating your box from the next box. So um, <clears throat> maybe in a warehouse, they're all together, but you know, maybe you need a little gap between boxes to get the forklift in. <clears throat> um, so I, I've tried to put them uh, in order of inside coming out. Uh, so width, padding, border, and then margin. Um, so I've got height 100 pixels and um, let's inspect this. <clears throat> so the width, uh, and this is applying to the content, so the width is 200. Uh, note that the height is 44. So the, the height has not actually worked. And I wanted to demonstrate that height doesn't have as good support as width does in, um, in basically plain CSS. CSS3 with grid and flex does handle height a little bit better. But you will find that width is very easy to control, but height um, can be a bit of a pain. So then we've got padding. Uh, so there's nice 20 pixels of foam chips or recycled paper foam uh, protecting the content from the box. And then you've got border. Uh, so that's 10 pixels. And then there's a bit of margin there separating uh, the content from the edge of the page. And I'm hoping that you can probably guess that the code box above, it doesn't have 10 pixels, sorry, 16 pixels of margin on the left, but rather um, a little bit more than 16. Oh, yes, it's 16 pixels because 16 pixels is 1 EM. If I adjust the slider, that will increase to more than 16 pixels, um, but the margin is currently set to 1 EM. <clears throat> so I've got a little example. This was the old RMIT website, and um, I actually had a student who who works uh, for the company that owns the RMIT balloon, and um, so that was nice to meet him. Uh, so this here is just here, and um, one thing to be aware of, and I, I do tend to ask questions, um, what is the size of this box? And by box, I mean how, si you know, how big is the box to the edge of the border? I know there's some margin here, but 
um, you know, how big is the box, the physical box, as in the cardboard. If you were trying to get this cardboard box in the back of your car and there was a nice television inside, um, you know, how big is it? And I'm hoping you can see that um, the content, say the width is 200, the content makes it another 40 pixels wide. And then the border makes it another 10 pixels wide. So even though this margin, so we'll ignore the margin because uh, it's going all the way to the right anyway. Um, this box is bigger than its width. So if you've got a 40 inch television, the box that you put the television in needs to be more than 40 inches diagonally um, because there's, you know, padding and, and the, the box itself takes up a little bit of room. So um, that's one little trap. And um, so I've got some questions here. Um, just asking you, how big is the red box? So take it to be in the outside. Um, the outside of this box. <clears throat> so and if, you, if, you, if you choose the wrong one, It'll be incorrect. So uh, I've got some um, absolute versus relative sizes. Um, uh, this this is a little bit tricky. So if I say the width is fifty percent, <laughs> um, the width is fifty percent. This is really nice. Um, the height is 50%. Um, well, that didn't work. As I said, um, support for height is a little bit trickier. Um, so I'm not going to set the padding. So if I set the padding, uh, notice the background color is extended. But if I remove that and actually set some margin, you get to see that um, there's no padding, but there's now margin between elements. Um, I'm going to remove this. Uh, also, please notice that the width is also increasing. Now, if I add padding, and this might be, I'll pick 5% because it's more obvious. Um, this has got, this box has got padding, and the box below it also has padding. So you've actually got two lots of padding here. And I'll just pop in a little bit of margin. Um, so you can see that the, you know, the, the box has got padding. Each box has got its own padding. Uh, now margin is treated differently. So I've got 2% margin on top, but I don't have 4% margin between elements. So margins generally collapse. So, um, So if I put on 5%, I've got 5% here and I've got 5% here. So that's something to be aware of that if, you, if you're if you setting the padding, you can find this quite frustrating that this gap is bigger than this gap. So sometimes you'll want to use margin, sometimes you'll want to use padding. Um, it's, you know, it's tricky. It, it's sort of... Um, it's something to play around with. Uh, so I'm going to add some border. So I've got some border there on the end. I'm going to set the width to be 100% just to demonstrate um, this problem that um, if you say the width is 100%, well, that that's the content is 100%. The television and the box is 100%. Um, but of course, this no longer fits in the box that you're trying to fit it in. So a 40 inch television won't fit in a 40 inch box. So this is why when you say set the width to be 100%, um, it can be a little bit frustrating. So um, CSS2 had this um, feature and that's why that mug is so popular. Um, so, so when I say mug, um, you know, content is escaping from the box. It's very frustrating with CSS. So CSS3, they tried to fix this by introducing uh, a new model, uh, the box sizing model. Uh, 
So by default, when you say the width is 100%, that's the width of the content. But <clears throat> if you say uh, box sizing, um, Oh, sorry. No, that's the name of the property, box sizing. So if you say it's a content box, that's the default. But if you say border box, um, so I've got box sizing border box, <clears throat> that means that um, it's taken that the box is that width. So when you say width, it means from here to here. It does include the margin. I just want to make sure that's 100% clear. So... Um, that means you can say the width now is 100%, and it is beautifully 100%. <clears throat> but um, the content, if we inspect, has been crunched down, has been crunched down to be less than 100%. So that's now 792, and I'll just uh, inspect this one. Um, so this is 852. And everything just gets bigger. But this one, uh, this one has crunched the content down so that the overall box uh, is fits into that space. And of course, as we saw last week, when I was trying to fit um, these, so this only starts going elliptical or elliptical. Uh, when this tiny element starts to overlap. Um, you know, sometimes you need to factor in that margin. So um, what you can say is calc and say, you know, 100%. And you can either put the figure in directly or you can say 2 times 30 pixels. So if your margin is 30 pixels, you can say, I want my width to be 100% minus two lots of margin. And um, I've got box sizing here, but you can obviously, if you wanted it to be border box, you can also say, take off the padding and the the border. But it's, you know, um, it's probably better to do this. Now, one thing with the calc function, uh, the spaces are required. Um, the engine that processes this does not understand 100% with no minus sign. Sorry, 100% minus sign with no space. It only understands these with spaces. So I, my guess is it um, explodes these on spaces and then looks at each token and um, works out how wide it needs to be. So this box um, has got margin. So if we didn't have margin, it would be 100%, and it would probably be poking off the edge of the page. Uh, but because I'm taking away an extra 60 pixels, it's nice and centered in the page. Um, there are some other nice features, and this is really good for um, having an adaptive layout. So if you have... Um, <clears throat> If you have an element and you want it to be, say, 50% width, but you don't want it to crunch down too much, you can, let me close this off. Uh, you can close this down and it will try and make that 50%. Uh, but then it will, then it will stop. It will say, no, I don't want to go below 300 pixels. Likewise, if you're going in the opposite direction, Uh, it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. It'll try to maintain its 50% width, and then it will hit 600, and then it will stop growing. So <clears throat> this um, this allows you to have content that adapts, but doesn't get too squashed or too stretched out. So um, that's really quite nice. And if you want to center such a box as this in the middle of the page, you just have to specify that the margin left and the margin right are auto. And if I click this box, 
that will be nice and centered so i'll just do a little bit of a little bit of uh, demonstrating just so you can see how you center a div inside another div text align doesn't always work unfortunately <clears throat> Okay, so moving now on to compact declarations. Um, and I did talk about this last week. Um, so you can specify what's going on on each dimension. So a box has got four sides, one, two, three, four. And try and try and follow the direction of a clock. So start at 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock. That will come in important. That will become important soon. So you can control um, the size of each, but you can, if they're all the same size, you can say padding is 10 pixels. And um, 10 pixels will be applied to all four sides. Now, if you, if you wanna have, um, you know, the top and bottom, you want those to be the same and you want right and left to be different, uh, you can compact them using this method so margin if you supply two numbers it will assume that um, the top and bottom are 10 pixels and then the the right and left are and there's a kind of like a, a sort of rule that um, it goes around <clears throat> applies 10 to the first one 20 to the next one and then because it's run out of numbers it then goes 10 and then 20. Um, you know, someone explained this rule to me, but I'm, I'm realizing I haven't got it in my head right now. But um, I promise you that <clears throat> if you just think of a clock, this does kind of work. Uh, then there's, then this, there's this obscure one, which is where there's three. So if you specify, if, you, if you've got the right and the left, <coughs> uh, which are the same size, um, you can actually specify three numbers. So what's happening here is it applies 10 to the top side, then 20 to the right side, then 30 to the bottom, and then Instead of going back to 10 pixels, it applies 20 to this side here, the right side. Um, oh, someone explained this to me, but it's just quite, kind of escaping me. So I'm just, I'm just having to tell you what the rule is here. So 10 pixels, 20 pixels, 30 pixels, and then 20 pixels uh, again for this side. And of course, four o'clock, uh, sorry, four, <laughs> sorry, four dimensions. Uh, so instead of specifying each one, top, right, bottom, left, um, you can say 12, so 12 o'clock, 12 pixels, and three o'clock, three pixels, six o'clock, six pixels, and nine o'clock, nine pixels. So I've just chosen those numbers just so you can remember how a clock works. Um, so border color style and width again we've got these just these different hyphens so border hyphen top hyphen color um, much as we have them here um, border right style again if these if these are the same then we can combine them I realize I've forgotten them um, border border weight here, say border left um, weight. Um, so we, what have we got? We've got, um, I think I think we've got 16 styles here. Maybe, why have I said 12? I can't remember now. I think that's, I think I multiplied by three instead of four there. But I'm trying to make the point that you you can have many many styles and you can base basically compact them all into one and the order doesn't matter you can say one pixel dotted orange or orange dotted one pixel or dotted one pixel orange um you just basically lose all these 
and just say border you know what you want on apply to all four sides <clears throat> so um, I recommend compacting as many as you can but of course if you have an effect in mind you will have to revert to um, doing this Or maybe no, maybe it is four. I think it's four times three. So four size times three different styles. Maybe twelve is correct. So uh, I should stop doubting myself. But if I'm wrong, please let me know. Okay, so um, that's basically the basics and also the box layout model. And now we're going to look at some advanced uh, styles. So we're going to look at um, maybe some prettiness, and then we'll look at some layout and positioning. So first of all, uh, we can just you know put on some nice little corners here. So border. <laughs> now we get into four top left radius. Now this is the problem because it's not like top left. We have to say top left because it's this one. There is no top um, corner here. Uh, so so. It's like 12 o'clock, but the 12 o'clock's over here. So sort of start in this corner. So top left, top right. We're still going sort of clockwise. Uh, start here. Dun, dun, dun. Um, now, if you want to compact all these, you can just say border radius and 10 pixels. So that'll be applied to all four, all, all four sides. And I've got an example here. So when you've got two values, um, so I've got here border radius 20 pixels, 80 pixels. So this one is 20 pixels, this one is 80, this one is 20, and this one is 80. Then three values, this is like a sort of Z effect. So this one is um, 20, this one is 50, this one is 80, and then this one is the 50 again. So this one is 20, this one is 50, and then this one is 80. And then all four style, styles back to clockwise, uh, 20, 40, 60, 80. Uh, if you want to have um, round shapes, you can say border radius is 50%. And um, so you the roundness goes right to the middle. So it is tighter here, and it does get slopey here. Now, if you drag this, uh, so you can get a nice round circle. So um, this is a nice way of, um, if you have a square photo, you can say border radius 50%, and you can get a nice round shape. And I just want to check whether, um, I think uh, we can go to canvas and if you drag this image you can see it's a square image but um, because this has got border radius 50% it's nice and round have, have a play with this you can see it's a square shape in a round hole a square peg in a round hole um, so this is the background image, so let's uh, talk about backgrounds now. Um, so if you want a background image, uh, specify the URL and just say where that um, image is. And of course, if you want to go up a directory or into a subdirectory, just pop uh, the location in there. So this one is resizable, and um, you can probably tell that it's actually a repeating image, so this looks very similar to this. So um, by default, the image usually, I think by default, images repeat. Um, now, if your image has got transparency, so if your image literally has got transparent pixels in it, so PNGs are very good for this, then um, if you've got a background color, so I'm saying background now, so I'm supplying a color at this moment, yellow, and there's a URL on top, which is um, this image. So the it's a bit like putting a poster over on top of a wall. The painted background is the 
background color and the URL is is the poster that goes on top. So if you change that to green, you can see the green color is coming through. And finally, the blue color is coming through. Um, so as I said, the default case is a repeating image. But if you don't want a repeating image, you can specify no repeat. Um, and there's also repeat X and repeat Y. So if you only want it to repeat in one di direction, you can do that as well. Um, another thing is you can see that uh, when you do the resizing, the um, basically the left corner, left top corner, is um, fixed. And so you, know, you get these broken tiles on the right, which may be what you want, um, but you may you may want a more centered pattern. So there is this uh, option called background position center. And um, I'll show you how that works on this slide. Uh, so no repeat, so repeat X uh, or repeat Y or initial or repeat both, repeats them in both directions. So I'll stick with X for the moment. So I want left line that's centered correctly. But if I choose center, um, uh, actually, I'll, I'll pick I'll pick initial just so you can see this. So um, what's happening is. I'm getting broken tiles top and bottom, but the the pattern is it's it's kind of symmetrical. So um, this might be a better effect. So if if you can imagine this as a floor tiling, you know, all the all of this is broken, but you know this the centering is nicer. <laughs> uh, if you say top, it's got a left right centering effect. So you don't care too much about the bottom, but then if you mm, if you have left, does that work? Yeah. So if you say left or right, uh, so th the right is fixed, but um, the top and bottom is working. So initial basically has the top left corner centered. This this does. Um, Trust me, when you start playing with backgrounds, you will you will want to mess around with this to get things looking right. Um, now, sometimes the focal point is not quite right. So you want to sort of focus on 2020. Um, so it's sort of focusing on here. And I'll just check no repeat. So <clears throat> sometimes you want this in the corner, but you know, like, it's too close to the boundary there. So if you just put it 2020, that's that's nice. It's away from the sides. Um, and this is where the calc comes in. If you want it down the bottom, you want it to be 100% in the bottom right. <clears throat> um, but there's no kind of way of getting that, you know, we haven't got that style yet. So if you want it 100% to the right, minus 20 pixels, <coughs> you can fix it so that it does this. So that 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 sometimes makes a nice little, um, you know, watermark just down there. Um, but the the style is quite um, complicated. And if you move it around, it sort of stays there. So uh, the next slide, uh, background size and origin. Um, Sometimes you've got you know a fairly nice image, and you don't want it repeating, but you want it to cover the side, you know, the whole background. So I'm going to pick this. So this one is in cover mode. Um, but if I want it to contain, so I want the whole image to be there all the time. Um, you can do this. So that's important choose contain but if you want cover basically just wallpaper you can do this obviously this is not an ideal image for um, a background wallpaper 
fifty percent. Hmm. Okay, so uh, at the moment, let me say fifty fifty percent. Um, I thought I, I thought I'd have a couple of mugs there. Um, so if I turn on the repeat, so I just want to show you what's happening. Um, have I got that right? Yeah, I have to. <clears throat> I choose initial. Does that repeat? I must have repeat turned off. Yeah, I thought that would give me lots of mugs. Um, okay, so um, let's go back to this. So contain cover. So fifty fifty, um, you'll get disproportionate squashing. So that's not a fan of that. Fifty percent just means one side. Uh, maybe this side. Um, that. Basically sets the size, and if you want it, to, uh, stretched in this case, which is not good. Um, you've got that there. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to change that back to just normal. Um, what do I want to do here? Oh yeah. So sometimes, uh, sometimes when you're zooming on an image, let's just say we're doing the cover again. So I want this to, con you know, in cover the whole background. But really, this bit here is is my focus. So I really want this bit to be in the image the whole time. So I can actually choose the focus point with this. So now when I zoom in and out, uh, it'll kind of focus in on something. So this this is a sort of a little bit better. So if you have a really nice background image, um, you may want to focus in, say, there might be a person in shot, and you want to sh focus on that person, and the background can be clipped. You, you don't really care. So um, background focus, that is what you need. Um, if you want to see the code, just um, pop here. Um, background size, background position. This is where all the styles are neatly, neatly housed. Um, and I include this one just to show you how good you can compact styles or how compact you can compact styles. So this background has got a green background. Uh, it's got an image. Um, I want the focal point to be 6045. And I've had to throw, throw in this um, forward slash um, just so there's no confusion. And I want, um, I want the image to cover. If I want all those things, this, this would take a lot of declarations. But essentially, I've got this tiny mug. It's, it's not pretty, obviously. Background color, you can see where I've cut around the image. Um, but I've got the focal point, and it's all covering. Maybe a better image would be, you know, I, I just hope this bad image demonstrates what's possible with one single line of CSS. OK, so, um, so another thing with CSS backgrounds is um, you can have more than one image and more than one position. So these slides, I don't want to turn these slides off because um, I don't want to lose my place. But if you, if you basically turn all the slides off, you can see that there's a background image here and a background image here and also a background image in the background that gives you this look. And I suppose you can probably see maybe see it just poking through um but have a play when there's no slides visible and you, you can see this effect happening um so this takes a little bit of effort and it took me a little while to get this right because i was sort of 
you know, I, it just was not working out for me. And then I worked out, oh, what's going on? So the background image, you specify one image, then the second image, and then the third image. And uh, normally they build up from the bottom, but this actually builds up from the top. So the abstract image, if you like, the background needs to be last. So this actually is different to how things are normally happen. Normally things are put on top of each other. Um, but this is how this works. So um, this one's on top. This is, if you're using Illustrator or Photoshop, this is the top layer. This is the, these are the step ones. So that's down a level. If I made it small enough, this would go under this. And then finally, the abstract image is right in the background. And when you say background repeat, you have to say it three times. So you can actually have a re one of the images can be repeating and the other one doesn't have to be. Um, so this is the first one. So that relates to this image. Uh, this relates to this image. Um, so these ones are a bit boring because they're the same. And then obviously I want the first image to be left aligned right there. I want the second image to be right aligned right there. And then the last one I want to be centered and I want it to be there in the background. And the background size, well, I want that to be 17, 17% um, of the view height. Uh, that might be in the assignment. Um, obviously, this recording might not relate to your period, but um, it could be could well be in the assignment that you're doing. So the viewport width is how big I want it to be. And I also want the right one to be 17% of the viewport width. And I want the background, the abstract background, to be a cover size. So when you, when you remove these slides, have a play around. You'll notice that the, the orb and the steps don't move. <clears throat> Sorry, the the crescent or the circle and the steps don't change. Let me put that into. Let me correct that. If you adjust the um, if you adjust the width, they will change size, but not in the same way that the background image does. I think if you change the height, they won't change size. It's only if you change the width they'll change. Um. Yeah, have a play you can, and, you know, come back to this slide for reference. Uh, it's a little bit complicated. Okay, so more, more background fun. Um, so, um, so, so we've seen sort of flat color. And in the past, before CSS3, if we wanted something like this, you know, blue opaque and then fading off into a you know, a slightly transparent version, we would need to to prepare that image in Photoshop and, and pop it in as a background image. But um, CSS3 allows us to basically create um, gradients. So um, I've got a fairly simple one. So I want to start in the left. So here's the left. And then I just want a uniform shift through the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, cyan, blue, and violet. And so what that will do is it will just blend those colors into each other, going from one to another. And uh, this one's a bit more subtle. Um, so this is a linear gradient going from the top, so from the top down. And I want it to be this cyan color, so 180 degrees. That's the color wheel down the bottom, cyan. And I want it to be 100% opaque and then completely transparent at the bottom. And that's what's happening here. Um, I can tilt this angle, so it doesn't need to be top or left or right. I can sort of have it starting here and then sort of going in this direction or 45 degrees. Maybe I'll pick one of these. Yeah, this this looks a little bit better, so it's nice and strong and then fading that way. You can definitely have a lot of fun uh, with this. So you just, that first number, instead of left, right, top, and bottom, you just specify how many degrees. I don't know if it supports radians. That would be fun. 
I use that um, lightly, um, but give it a go uh, if you're interested. Now, uh, this this is an important thing. Um, this is not supported in all browsers, so um, you may have to use the vendor prefixes, and I have had to repeat those styles. Uh, you saw last week I thought I'd made a mistake. But what was happening is it didn't recognize the official standard. So it only recognized the, um, the WebKit version. Um, so that's, that's just a simple gradient. But sometimes we want a repeating gradient. So if you want something that looks like, um, uh, you know, maybe curtains, but, you know, sometimes corrugated iron, um, you can specify, and why have I said 270 degrees? Um, I think that's like a maybe a 90 degrees or something. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm specifying, uh, it's like a sort of dark red. So A is, uh, what is that? T that's 10 out of 16. Sorry, 15 out of 15 steps with zero being a number. And then I go to full or 15 out of 15 on the ridges. So that's causing this sort of nice gradient between light and dark. And I'm saying 5%, 10%. So what you'll see is the number of ridges is always 10 because it's going 5%, 15%, 25%, etc., all the way to 95%, 100. Now, if you want hard stripes, uh, this is a little bit of a trick. Um, Say, I want um, dark red to blend into dark red, in other words, no difference, over 10 pixels. And then I want dark red to blend in with bright red over zero pixels. So you, what happens is you get a step in this case. So it steps from dark red to bright red. And then I want bright red to blend with bright red over 10 pixels. So bright red blended with bright red there. And um, yeah, that's how you get hard stripes. And I've chosen a different angle of attack there. So that's linear gradients. Um, we also have radial gradients. So just expand this. Um, so I'm just blending from the center red going out to white in the sides. <laughs> um, now this fits the whole thing in pretty much um oh no sorry uh this is cl uh, i'll say that again it's basically it's fitting in but it's cropping the sides so this is this is right the corners are white but uh, it's cropping the sides if you want the effect to, to stay in the box you just pick um closer side and it then makes sure that um, white is all around and there's a lot more white in the corners um, add the word circle if you want um, the shape to be circle so this this sort of does a squashed ellipse but if you want it to be to keep it circular effect and um, you're probably connecting now that that's what I'm doing here this is a linear gradient uh, so if I make this smaller it's it's sort of stuck at the top so there's the center there and uh, so that's how I'm getting this effect and um, And I'm using the word circle, obviously. And um, we can have the repeating radial, so we get these. Um, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, Michael Myers, Austin Powers, that kind of Austin Powers '60s sort of thing. Uh, so this is the like a sort of candy effect, and. Um, so honestly, you're just saying radial instead of linear, red, white, red. So you're blending from one to the other. But if you want hard stripes, you do the same same effect. And this one I want 
it to be a circle and um and what's that red doing there oh yeah that's right so red at zero pixels i want it to blend in with red until 20 pixels so blend red with red no difference uh then i want to blend red with white over zero pixels so it steps up from red to white and then i want white to blend with white over the next 20 pixels and then just keep repeating this pattern and that's how you get this kind of um hard circular stripes oh gosh there's more slides um okay so uh moving on to shadows um now a shadow is a shadow when the the shadow color is darker but we can also if you make the shadow color lighter um it's actually you know you get a, it's like having a highlight <clears throat> or a glow so um just be aware you can you can overuse um drop shadows so drop shadows can help to lift text so if you've got a, a strong background um having a drop shadow on the text can lift it so even a subtle shadow uh, where you're not even aware that there's a shadow on the text can often help read um, make text more readable um, so what i've got here is that there's a box shadow so there's a shadow on the box uh, and it's a, a gray color so hash three three that's um red green and indigo blue um, at three out of 15 and the box shadow, the box shadow um, has got an extra number so you can make the size of the box the shadow larger and I think I've got a have I got a triad editor yeah coming up that's good <clears throat> so this one controls um, these two numbers control the direction of the shadow so um, it's almost like the light source is coming from one pixel. That's the first one. One pixel. That's the second one. We'll we'll see how this this works in a moment. And then uh, the blur, how blurry the shadow is. So um, if you want a sharp shadow, bring this number down. Um, but if you want a sort of like blurry shadow, make this number bigger. And this is the size of the shadow, and it only works on boxes. Uh, so anything that's like a div or a span. Um, and what I've got here is a text shadow. So again, there seems to be a light source coming in from this direction. And I want it to be two pixels. And CC9, that's actually a cyan uh, color. So that's just making, that's just basically making the text, it just gives it a bit of a lightness. Um, so that it's more readable against the blue background. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I, exp I explained that in more directional, in more detail. Uh, the fourth number is not, uh, optional, so if you don't want to supply that number, you don't have to. Oh, uh, this is an example of the fourth span. That's actually, um, um, I knew I had orange colors. Uh, so that's a span inside a span inside a span inside a code element. Um, if you want the reverse effect, so this looks like it's um, popping out, but if you want it to look like it's being pushed into the page, uh, just add this word inset, and it will it will basically push it into the page um, instead. <clears throat> And what I've got is I've got a, um, I've actually got a shadow on the image. Now the image um, needs a filter and a drop shadow. <clears throat> and so I've just popped in one pixel, one pixel, one pixel. So the light seems to be coming from this size. And I've got four, a four pixel spread. So um, that's now turning this into a glow. And I've got FFF, which means full, full, full. Or 15 out of 15 so that is a that is as white as you can get um, the be, be aware the filter is really cool you can actually 
do more effects. You can like invert colors and have grayscale and all sorts of things. It's not just for drop shadows when it comes to images. Um, so I've got a I've got a play a play one here, so you can change the inset. Um, oh, that didn't work. Um, Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I don't have any uh, figures. So it, it had a default setting. So let me just um, pop some numbers in here. So this is the size of the shadow. So if I want to make that five pixels, it's pushing it down. But if I need another five, it's now pushing it this way. Um, maybe 10 pixels. No. Uh, so if I want the... Oh, no, I think I do need 10. Yeah, that's... This is a very harsh shadow, so I wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't be doing it that badly. Um, if you want it negative, um, you can do it like this. So it looks like the light's coming from the other side. And um, if you want to change the color, so input style equals color. Let's change it to white. <clears throat> So uh, a little bit exaggerated here. So let's just go back to one pixel. <clears throat> so it's it's now kind of adding a sort of like a highlight. It looks like there's a highlight coming from that side. And if I just spread the blur a little, maybe make that one blank. <clears throat> it's um. looks like it's just being clipped like there's a light source coming from this direction but it's actually a <clears throat> it's casting a if you like a white shadow from um, the direction here so you can certainly have a play and I've, I'm sort of applying the styles to all of them so you can see uh, what it looks like Um, so I've done a combination here. So, um, you know, I've got like a sort of highlight effect on this side and a drop shadow here. So it's looking very 3D. Um, I hope you're not cringing too much, but I, I did want to show you what's possible just there. And those are the styles that you need. So there's, there's the highlight, the bright uh, white highlight and the um, darker shadow. Notice that um, the shadow is actually black, but it's 70% opaque. So what's happening is it's dark, but the background color is coming through. And that's probably what um, shadows are more like. It's actually the... Um, make sure you don't choose black colors, uh, because that does tend to look... It does tend to look fake. I mean, it looks good, but um, the shadow is definitely black. Whereas if you choose a translucent color, it allows the background color to come through. Okay, moving on to layout. Okay. Um, I almost want to break here. Just take another sip. Um, so um, now before we've seen inline elements and block elements, and you can actually change um an element style so even if um let's just say you've got a div and you want it to be inline you can and if you've got an inline element ooh, let's say a span you can turn it into a block element so um i suspect that is what canvas has done <clears throat> but there's a really nice um element called inline block and um what this does is it actually combines the best of both worlds so um, um, the in, insides are treated like a block element, but it is allowed to float um, in whatever is contained in as though, it's, um, as though it's an inline element. So the contents are kept together, um, but the, the element itself is allowed to flow. And this is really good for um, baseline adaptive pages. So if you've got some elements, they can 
they can stretch out on a large page so you can have two up or three up or four up <clears throat> but on a narrow page they can all collapse into one column and the contents are sort of kept um are sort of kept together which is nice and there's other there's other styles so run in table all of these ones and also flex and inline flex as we've kind of seen with uh, canvas um, so for example um, if you've got navigation you've got um, list elements and you want them to be um, inline you can swap them over likewise if you've got um, a hyperlink that's usually an inline display uh, you can turn all those into blocks uh, for example if you want so um, i've got an example here so i've got a lot of content here and i'm going to turn all of the inline elements into block elements so um sorry I'll, I'll say that again i'm turning all the spans into um into block elements now i'm going to turn them back into inline so we can see where they are so this is a span and that's another span and uh inline elements can split so this one is split and it continues on this line <clears throat> Uh, now, if I change this to inline blocks, this is where the beauty is. So the elements are kept together. So you get the inline effect, but see this element, it, it gets shorter. Uh, it's then put on to the next line because it wants to keep the content together. So um, this is a really nice effect. And... Um, I'm a big fan of inline blocks. And I even strongly recommend you have navigation A display inline block. That's a bit of a hint for the assignment. Um, now, uh, visibility, sometimes you want to hide things. So you can either say display none, and this makes things disappear, or Things can still be in the scene. So if you think about Harry Potter with his invisibility cloak or um, um, Frodo uh, with his invisibility ring in Lord of the Rings, um, you can make things invisible so they're there, but um, you can't see them. So I've got an example here. So I'm going to turn this to none and it collapses put it back to inline and it returns however this this text I'm changing it to hidden and it's still there it's just um, you know you can't see it so sometimes you want to do this other times you want to do that Okay, so moving on to CSS positioning, and I want to just sort of say, um, try not to overuse positioning. If you specifically put elements in a certain place, it might look good on your screen, but if you adjust the window, um, you know, things go crazy. So I try not to use positioning unless I really need to. Unless I'm doing something tricky like this, um, I don't I don't really use positioning if I can get away with it. Uh, so this is the default. So you don't even have to type this. Everything has got its static position, so everything is put on the page and it just stays there. Even though you're scrolling, um, this content is static. It's it's where it belongs. Um, now, what we can do, the first thing we can do is we can change an element's um, style to be relative. And there's no immediate difference, but it means that we can start to move things left and right, up and down. Um, absolute means it's positioned relative to 
the root HTML element, or if there's some element between the root HTML element and an ancestor, then um, that has a non-static position, such as relative, uh, then um, it will position it relative to that element. So it will still scroll with the page, um, but it will be it won't be where it normally would be. Um, fix, this is quite a nice one. This is how these ones work. Um, so the footer and the, okay, the header is, I think the header is sticky these days. Is that right? Oh, I won't, I won't do that. I think the header is sticky, but the footer is fixed to the bottom. So I think that one still works. And then there's your initial inherit. And this is the new sticky one. So I think my navigation, it was here. And then as I scrolled, it came to the top and got stuck. And in Canvas, um, I can't remember quite how I've done this. I think I have I had to write this using a script. So, But this, this is the sticky effect um, when things are programmed correctly, I will say. <clears throat> So um, so this may no longer be true because I think I did I did make um, the the navigation sticky just recently. Okay, so uh, when an element is not static, we can change its position. Um, so we'll just discuss relative first. So I'll show relative first. Um, so if I adjust the top, it actually pushes it down from the top. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. So if I say top 15 pixels, it gets pushed down. Um, likewise, if I say bottom 15 pixels, it gets pushed up uh, from where it should be. Uh, left, it moves it left. In other words, it moves it to the right. Right, it moves it to the left. And um, zero is, if you like, your default positions. Um, now, if I pick um, static, I just want to show you it not changing. It's um, static, essentially. So um, now I'm going to choose um, fixed, and hopefully, <clears throat> uh, it's right there. So I can scroll the page, and it's not moving. So this is now like this. So if I want it down the bottom, uh, bottom, it's down there left it's gone away <laughs> i'll bring it back uh, it's probably right at the top of the page at the moment um so i'll choose bottom uh so if you want it at the bottom but not right at the bottom you can say bottom 15 pixels and it'll just be a little bit away okay <clears throat> and um absolute that definitely is at the top of the page now. So, um, but um, I will show you, um, let me just pull up my secure website. Not that one, choose this one. Um, navigation bars uh, with drop downs. Uh, what, how I've done this, and I'll just show you how to drop down menus. So this is the CSS and I uh, sort of sourced um, source code from this one and you will notice that um, navigation li elements are positioned relative uh, do i have a navigation um, so what i'm doing is is um i want to have absolute position so any ul that's inside a ul so any sub menu that's inside a you know, a root menu. Uh, I want that positioned absolutely, um, but it will be positioned absolutely to a navigation li element. And um, I'm displaying the li elements as an inline block. So these are these round ones are the li. These are the li items. So I'm positioning this ul, this sub menu, relative to this li element, which is um, the top menu. So if you want to build a 
um, a submenu like this, not for the assignment, but for some other reason. Um, I've got this tutorial here. <clears throat> or maybe I am asking you to do this in the assignment if it's a different study period. Um, but this tutorial will help you. And it's pretty pretty sure this is the bare bones. This just um, gives you this, this kind of functionality. <clears throat> and then these just happen to be the colors and the borders and stuff that I'm using in my um, in my secure area. Um, sticky positioning. So um, yeah, this is fairly new. So I've only recently introduced sticky positioning. So this is all very sticky. So if I say top zero pixels, I scroll down it's got the original position and then bump it stays there um, now if i set the bottom to zero pixels <clears throat> those are now off screen so if i scroll down they then stick to the bottom and don't go any further so you've probably seen this like with um menus um when you're scrolling the menu sort of stay there and on facebook you know the ads scroll up and then they stick <clears throat> and then their parent goes off screen and then a new ad comes up um there's a lot of play now i'm going to set both now so this will just basically stick to the top and bottom and uh, just go between the two so <clears throat> lots and lots of fun there <clears throat> and that's your static position and um, Z position where we're almost at the bottom this is so cool um, so what I've got here is Z index so we can um, position things relative in Z space so uh, you know this is X space Y space and Z coming forwards uh, zero is the uh, default card and zero is on top of all these because it's come afterwards um, but it's below one and below two so if you ever need um, oh i don't know something to be on top of something else just pop in some z index so this is on top of this and this is on top of the main <clears throat> um, z index is what you need just just watch out don't say z index 9999 that's overkill just use you know single digits just so that you don't um you know you don't run out of integers basically um i've seen some websites like canvas where they they want something to be on top of something else and so they say z index 99999 and it's like well nothing nothing can go on top of that now um be don't be wasteful when it comes to z index and um i'm not sure if it's obvious but there is a card let me um let me inspect this i'm going to try and um make this section um is it visibility um hidden Oh, the card's in that. Sorry, ah, that didn't work. <laughs> I'll cancel that. Um, I promise you, there is uh, there is a card under here. Um, actually, I've got a better idea. I'm going to make this section background color. <clears throat> um, I'll use this FFF, -F -F, so that's white, and I'll say three. So there's the card, it's underneath. I don't think I can actually access it. Um, so nine, It's because uh, it's minus one, it's actually under the default uh, page. So, so I'll just turn that off and um, put it back to normal. So there is a card underneath there. Uh, so almost at the bottom. So um, the, there's this new 
idea of layout. Um, as I said before, vertical alignment has always been a bit of a pain. And, um, you know, it's, it's a problem. So uh, in CSS3, this new way of laying out um, elements using the flex layout model was designed. Um, and um, basically what what you do is you have a you have a sort of um you have a parent element that uh, displays as flex and then their children will shrink and grow to fit the height and the bug that i was fixing in canvas was um this element was given you know flex basis of one and this one was also given a flex basis of one and this is why this one was just crunching into this one so this is an example where flex wasn't really working actually i hope i haven't broken that that's good that, they're still draggable that's good um so what i've done here um is i've got this aside and it's so first of all i've got the um the parent container so the, all of this is inside the parent <clears throat> so the header is outside and the footer is outside and this is inside so i've got um a style that i would never normally do just noticed um so uh the first element and another thing is um, they don't have to be in order so the aside is first but I've said I want this to be the third element. So it's over here, even though it's first in the code, which is quite cute. Um, so I want this element to have 150 pixels of width. And so that will not change. That is set to be 150 pixels. Now, the other two elements, uh, whatever space is left over from, you know, defined widths, they will be given a share. So because this one's got five, the main, which is this one here, um, this will get five sixths of the remaining space, and the navigation will get one sixth of the remaining space. So if you look at this, the navigation's width is a, is, is a fifth of the mains. But if you add these five shares and this one share, it adds up to six shares. And um, shrink it down. Um, this is still a sixth, and that's still five sixths of the remaining space. <clears throat> um, so... Um, if you want to have a look at this, you can, but you can do, hopefully you can do the assignment without um, worrying, you know, without using flex. But some people, maybe more design oriented, might want to look at flex. Uh, there's a tutorial, so this will step you through some of the more advanced um, tutorials. Uh, sorry, the more advanced um, things you can do. Um, and closing today's... Um, Closing today's uh, tutorial is media queries. And uh, what you can do is, uh, now this is mobile first programming. So um, when you're on a mobile device, obviously you've got um, limited power. You're not connected to the grid and also limited processing power. So the strategy of mobile first is when you have a style sheet, put in the styles that mobile devices will want. So they then don't need to worry about processing all this code and then overwriting it with some other styles. So um, what I've got is MQ panels relate to these panels here. So I'm displaying them as an inline block and um, box sizing border box because I want them to crunch down, the content to crunch down. And I want the width to be 100% divided by one. So what does that mean? Well, when I shrink the window, um, I want <laughs> the, 
them to take up 100% of the width. Now, if, if uh, the window gets a little bigger and it's a, a screen rather than, um, say, a printer, um, if the width gets above 700 pixels, I want the width to be 100% divided by 2. So what I want to have happen when it hits 700 pixels, which is about to happen, whoop, there it went. Just show you that again. It went from a single column layout to two column layout. So one, two, three. So now they're 50%, and I'm going to keep making it bigger, bigger, bigger. Oh, that was quick. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's really quick. So I'll just show you that again. So it's between 700 and 800, and then... Uh, and snap. So now I want the width to be not 33.33333333, but rather 100% divided by 3. So as, as many decimal places as the computer allows. And um, yeah, so that's basically media queries, which is a sort of better way of laying things out. And the, the only styles that should really go in media queries are layout-like styles. So this is another way of making sure that your content adapts to different size devices. And so, okay, so that's um, the end of Lecture 5. Um, the Tutin Lab materials are in Tutin Lab 6. So please bring your queries to chat number 6. And um, I'll see you in that chat if you're free. <laughs>